Good evening, Pleasant View Baptist Church friends and family, and Salem Baptist Church friends and family, those folks watching us uh, via Facebook Live and watching this in recording later on. We're going to continue on tonight in the, the Epistles of Paul study. This is part four. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians, or maybe it's 3 Corinthians. And uh, we're going to spend some time on that. I know it's we don't do these letters justice because these are long letters, and we just kind of fly over do a bird's eye view of these things so we cover the best that we can and we leave a lot out so I hope if nothing else this whets your appetite to want to get into this and study it Paul planted the church at Corinth in 53 or so AD scholars disagree on the dates but a little bit and probably had written a letter back to the church in 57 AD while he was staying in just down the road in Ephesus and I said tonight, is it 2nd or 3rd Corinthians? So let me spend a minute of time. This is not in your book, so I'll spend a minute or two here talking about why this could be, and probably is, at least 3rd Corinthians, just from the text itself. So the first letter that Paul had written to Corinth is called the Lost Letter. It's often referred to as the Lost Epistle. This correspondence is mentioned in 1st Corinthians, so chronologically, the first Corinthians, which we don't have, was lost in time. And we know this for a fact because if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Mm. So in his first letter, he wrote to them. And then in our 1 Corinthians, which is really 2 Corinthians, he writes again. The same kind of problem has been going on there. And then the second letter of Corinthians is really 1 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Not to confuse you guys, we've just lost the first one. So... Our first Corinthians is the second letter to Corinth. Right. This letter we know as the first as first Corinthians. Chronologically, it's the second letter Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And then Third Corinthians, or Second, second. Corinthians, <laughs> we call Third Corinthians, often referred to as the severe letter. This is the letter that causes the sorrow. Chronologically, it's the third letter Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Now, some scholars think there's a, this is actually fourth Corinthians. I'm just going to go with what the text you can deduce from in the text is that this is at least the third letter he wrote to Corinth, the first one we don't have because he references that one and the other ones. Right. The text here says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears. That's 2 Corinthians. Right. I'm going to call them by the names we normally go by. Yeah. And for though I cause you sorrow sor by my letter, 2 Corinthians 7, 8. So he's referencing 1 Corinthians there. Cameron? I will say, if there is um, a, like a story or a letter that uh, has been left out of the Bible, it's probably not terribly important because God put everything that we need into the Bible. It won't add to what we have, probably, and it certain w certainly wouldn't contradict. I mean, it might add other conflicts in the church, of course, but we don't need that, right? I always encourage folks to remember, you're just reading somebody else's mail anyway. You're writing, reading letters to churches written in the first century to an audience that wouldn't even speak our language or understand us if we were to show up in their neighborhood today in the time machine and talk to them. We're intercepting their mail. Now, it's divinely inspired, so God has preserved this for our edification, for the building up of the saints, for reproof, correction, those kinds of things, as Paul says to Timothy. So it is secondarily to us. More, You could say it more accurately, it is not to us, but it is for us. Right. Better way of saying that. So, without a doubt, you can say there was a 1 Corinthians we don't have because he mentions it in his first letter to Corinth that we have. But don't let that bother you. Cameron is right. Uh, if, if, there, if there was a 1 Corinthians, don't let it bother you. God gave us what we need in the Bible. I, I would suspect there was five or six letters of Corinth. Why would Paul just write two or three? He corresponded. He was in Ephesus for a while, corresponding back and forth. So, why would he not write more than that? Right. Uh, and there's le letters to churches he planted that we don't have. Um, we just have... The church of Philippi and Thessalonica, uh, uh, Ephesus, but other churches along the way planted that we don't have letters from. Maybe he wrote to the church in Athens. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but what we do have is God is preserved for us, and it's for our good. So let's begin tonight with 2 Corinthians chapter, and I'll let you read all the Corinthian text. If it's going to be a bunch of it. You ready for this? You, you're warmed up and ready to go. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to go to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. 
Yeah. Achei, I think I've heard it pronounced that way. Achei. Um, so here's the first question. Why did Paul have to reassert his authority in every letter they'd written? An apostle not of men, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Because if someone were to pick out one of them, they might not know exactly. Because not everyone's starting from the very beginning. What do you mean? Like, if they were to pick out one from that letter, and he has to get his point across. Like, if they were, to, if they were for example, pick out one letter from all of them, they might read that and think, oh, it's going to this person instead of this person. But in the very first letter, it says that. Like, if you if you open a book and you right. go to a random chapter, you're, you're like, you're going to be puzzled. So he needs to remind you. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, like, if you... Well, he didn't think, when he wrote this, he, didn't think it was, he did not think these letters were going to a book we call the Bible. No, but no, not that. No, 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 you're, no, that's not what I mean. These are letters written to people. It's just like you write a letter to somebody down the road. You make sure no, that your name and their name if, is on it. If one of the letters go missing or say they just find themselves in the middle of it somehow, then they would need to know Okay. That. Yeah. So no matter what letter you read of Paul, you, yeah, you, knew it was you from would Paul. know. That's yeah. exactly right. He certainly needs to assert his apostolic authority. Why at Corinth? Uh, Corinth was messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Especially... In this church, they have these super apostles come into the congregation. They've had these false teachers come in. He has to say, I've called by God, not by men. Right. The other apostles, you can make a case that they met Peter's criteria in Acts chapter 1 for an apostle. Right. Have known, been with Christ since his baptism, been with his, his ministry, and then saw him after the, uh, up to the ascension. Right. Now, Paul didn't meet that criteria, so he has to say, an apostle not of men. Now, but Peter's criteria, which I think is a good criteria. Yeah. And I think that's, that is the minimal to be an apostle. And I think there are others who qualified as apostles, perhaps we don't often think of as being apostles. But I'm going to chase that road, rabbit too far down the road. Uh, like John Mark, for example. He wasn't one of the 12 disciples, but he writes the Gospel of Mark. Luke as well. I think he's an apostle, doesn't, though he's not one of the 12. And he's not a replacement to Matthias, uh, of Judas. To, he's not Matthias. At least he is an apostle standing in the place writing scripture as an authority. Yeah, we don't know anything about Matthias. Mm -hmm. He disappears, doesn't he? He's just mentioned once and he's gone. And he was a guy we don't know much about in the Gospels because even though he saw Christ's baptism, met the criteria, was with him all through his ministry and saw him to the ascension, well, he was just he was an eyewitness, but we don't know how much, how close he got to the inner circle. Was he part of the Twelve? Did he sit on the campfire? Was he at the okay. you know, fellowships and in the homes? Probably was. He probably was a follower of Christ all the way through it. But that's a good point. But now Paul has to assert his his authority as apostle, not from men, but always the will of God. Mm -hmm. Especially in Corinth, where they would doubt him with the authority. Right. I'm going to break this up in sections here. Again, there's no way we can, we're not going to read all the chapters and verses in 2 Corinthians. I just want to kind of hit that, what I think is the important themes here um, to his letter. So, let me say if we're going any further tonight, 1 Corinthians, Paul cuts. He cuts. Discipline. Hard, right? So, right. And in 2, he provides, 2 Corinthians, he provides a salve. Right. Right. So where he's cut the first time, we saw last week, he's hard on the church. And the second one, he provides a salve. He provides a healing form. So keep that in mind. We're going to see that surface tonight. Oh, so first section is Paul's plans, God's plans. Paul's plans, God's plans. 2 Corinthians 1, 15 through 20. Because I was confident of this, I wanted to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and then come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes, and no, no? But... As surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me, and Silas, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Very good. Now... Paul's getting criticized. Read between the lines here. The people of the church of Corinth are saying, Paul's a liar. He said he would come back to Corinth, and he's not come back here. And Paul says, look, guys, I, I plan to come back. I, I wanted to go up 
Look at the map here. He wanted to go uh, from Ephesus up to Thess uh, up to Thessalonica, or from where he is now up uh, up to Thessalonica, and then his way back down back to back to Corinth. He wanted to hit, kind of visit them on the way, but he was he was prevented from doing that. Things got in the way of doing that, and he couldn't. So because he couldn't keep his word, people said, "Oh, he's a liar. He's he, he's." Uh, He's just telling us what we want to hear. He's not ever going to come back here. And so Paul's like, look, I, I meant to keep the promise. Something came up, I couldn't do that. But but Christ never breaks his promise. It's always yes. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I put in the map here, Paul planned to go back north to Macedonia, perhaps even to Philippi, and then back to Corinth before he went to Judea. He did not, and he could not. And so that's why they're saying Paul just lied to you all. Well, Judea is way down there. Yep, that's Jerusalem. He's going to, yeah. It's a long distance there. He plans to go from Ephesus to Corinth, mm -hmm. up to Philippi, but instead he has to make the trip to Judea. 2 Corinthians 1, 23. I call my God as my witness, and I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Now, he's going to tell us another one reason why he doesn't go back to Corinth immediately after getting the news mm -hmm. Uh, from Aquila and the household that there's so much dysfunction in the church and they're not repented. Or at that point, they had not. God's my witness, Paul says. I wanted to go back to you guys as quick as I could, but I spared you. Now, what does that mean? Uh, and I'll read some commentary here. This verse, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians one twenty three. this verse is designed to show the church of Corinth the true reason why he had changed his purpose and had not, and had not visited them according to his first proposal. And that reason was not that he was fickle and inconsistent, but it was that he apprehended that if he should go to them in their irregular and disorderly state, he would be under a necessity of resorting to harsh measures and to, and to severity of discipline that would be alike painful to them and to him. Paul's change of purpose about visiting them was made before he wrote his first epistle, that he had first resolved to visit them. But that on subsequent reflection, he thought it would be better to try the effect of a faithful letter to them, admonishing them of their errors and entreating them to exercise proper discipline themselves on the principal offender. Mm. Let me say this. Have you ever typed an email or a text message or a social media post and then said, I can't post that? Right. right. <laughs> if yeah. what I post, I speak it of myself, is offensive, you ought to see what I didn't post. Yeah. You want to see what I deleted. Because <laughs> sometimes the Holy Spirit says, you know, there's no good that comes from that. For sure. uh, and I do put a lot of things out there for the sake of discussion. Um, some I just poke fun at. Some of it's tongue-in-cheek. But there's a lot of things I uh, type in. Oh, this would be be too much on second thought. Paul's kind of saying that here. I, I, when I heard what came from the house of Aquila about this dysfunctional church of Corinth, I wanted to go there and grab you. I'm making this. I'm paraphrasing greatly here. It's, it's implied. Grab you by the shirt collar and you know shake you and say stop doing this. But instead, I wrote a letter and I encouraged you guys to discipline the members of the church that were in error yourselves. Take care of it yourselves. And that was the right course of action. Yeah. He did not send the first draft of that email. He did not send <laughs> out that letter. You know, once it goes out, it's in. It's it's yeah. out there. <laughs> so he rewrote it. He replanned it. He didn't go right to them. He spent some time to cool down, I suppose, and then wrote them a much better letter, I guess. Right. It's always best to let God do the talking when we're upset yes. as best as we can. And what he would have been uh, compelled to write at first may have not have been of divine origin. Right. So he lets the Holy Spirit guide the pen, and we get 1 Corinthians out of that, mm -hmm. which is still a pretty harsh letter, to be honest with you. He, he doesn't hold back. Question number two tonight. So now that you know the context of why he didn't go back, what kept Paul from keeping his promise to visit the church of Corinth? He had to go to Judea. Ultimately, he did. But yeah. what else would have kept him from going there immediately? He said something. He didn't want to be harsh with them. True. In person. He didn't want to come down on them any harder than he already had. And maybe, you know, God kind of told him that, you know, the, the first first letter, which would be the second letter, uh, it had its effect, mm -hmm. you know. So just, just chill out, Paul. Right. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Count backwards from 100. <laughs> do those things we all do to, to get calm, right? And he did that. 
Does God ever break his promise? No. 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 While Paul might break his promise, because we're all human beings, uh, God does not break his promise. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Even James in his epistle says, don't say tomorrow I'll go to town and buy this or those goods, but say if the Lord wills. We say things like, if the Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. Right. Well, if the Lord's willing, the creek is irrelevant. Right? <laughs> right. It doesn't matter if it freezes over and you walk across it or it floods over and you boat across it. Or if it's dry and you walk through the creek. Does you know, the Lord's willing, the creek is irrelevant. The idea here is Paul said, look, we, it may look like we deceived you by, by our yes and no stuff, but God never breaks his promise, and we're thankful for that. Right. Amen. God's plans, Paul's plans. Paul's pains, God's pains. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, grieve you, who is left to make me glad but whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that would share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart. And with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Very good. Mm. And the commentary, Jeff, can pick that up. Yeah, you can sense the depth of Paul's, of the love that Paul had for the church of Corinth. He had spent 18 months in Corinth. It pained him to have to disciple. Or discipline. That's discipline. Not. Had to discipline the church in his previous letter. Yeah, that, that's a good point because, you know, like you said last time, church discipline is one of those things that's long forgotten in the church uh, by and large in this country and sometimes those who still practice it don't do it out of love mm -hmm. and that's good to be reminded that everything that, that we should do as Christians, especially when it comes to correction, needs to be motivated by love, not anger or frustration mm -hmm. We don't have the original manuscript that Paul handled but I bet if we had 2 Corinthians, they'd be tear stained. Right. I bet that'd be ink smudges from Paul's tears running off his cheeks and dripping on the page of Second Corinthians. Right. Because as many parents say when they go discipline their child, it's going to hurt me worse than it hurts mm -hmm. you. And his kids might say, well, then let me have the battle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it really does as parents, it hurts us. And we have to hide that from time because we don't want, we have to be strong when we discipline our kids. But it really hurts to have to correct your, your children. That's it really hurts us more than it hurts the child emotionally. Right. Um, and Paul's saying that same kind of thing here. Uh, it really hurt me to do this, but I wrote this letter, you know, as God led me to, great anguish of heart and many tears. You know, this, there's drips of tear, Paul's tears on the pages he wrote this letter to the, to the Corinthians. You know, we get this, the impression of Paul, and looked at him last week physically, the second century description of him, bald-headed, unibrow, hook nose, <laughs> wobbly legs, uh, not a very opposing figure. And then you say, well, he was just mean-spirited. He wrote these things about women, and he wrote these things about the church, and mm -hmm. he is very mean-spirited. All letters that Paul had written, you might kind of get that feel about him. Yes. But when you get to 2 Corinthians, you don't get that feel. This is his most personal letter that he'd written in the New Testament. It's the only letter that I know that he pours his heart out like this. He's literally crying as he writes the letters. Okay. When you read 2 Corinthians... You get the sense that he had deep love and compassion. He was really hurt by these people. He felt betrayed. He was emotionally wounded. And he had great care for these people. That's a side you don't get of Paul in 1 Corinthians. Right. You don't get that of Paul in Galatians. You get a lot of anger and calling out the Judaizers. 2 Corinthians, thankfully, this letter, if nothing else, gives us a different side of Paul. Right. Well, that's a good lesson for all of us, especially in ministry. Um, there's a lot of things that come against you in ministry. A lot of opposition at times or misunderstandings or... Things fall apart, and it's easy to get bitter. Moses got a little bitter with the people of Israel that disqualified him from going into the promised land. And if you're going to be in ministry for the long haul, you have to. There's going to be lots of occasions for you to become bitter. That's right. And it's a good lesson from the apostles' pen that you know, may, things may be bad, but they're God's people. Uh, God loves them. I need to love them too. <laughs> now, I heard someone say this some time ago, and I forgot. It was, it was something I read that. Uh, a pastor needs four things, and I only remember two of the four. <laughs> One was the heart of a child, and the other was the skin of a rhinoceros. <laughs> yeah. So you need to have a tender heart, but thick skin. Right. And Paul, I think he has both. Yeah. yeah. God's plans, Paul's plans. Paul's pains, God's pains. Mm. Next one, God's seal on believers' hearts. 
2 Corinthians 1, 20-22. Now it is God who makes both of us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. 2 Corinthians 5, 5. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. I just want to pick up, jump to chapter 5. We're going to go back to chapter 2 in a moment, but I want to connect these two verses because it's the same kind of thought that Paul is saying here. And let's ask the question and answer it together in real time here. What thing guarantees the promise of God? In other words, how would they know when God, when Christ was going to return, even if Paul could not? So let's first... First question first. What thing guarantees God's promise of getting you home to heaven? The Holy Spirit. As a deposit. As a deposit. The presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, I guess. That's what he's saying. Is that what he's saying? I don't think that's what he's saying. Um, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. That's God's guarantee that you're saved. Mm -hmm. It's God's guarantee that you're going to be brought home. Yeah, so there's two way, two things Paul, two analogies Paul is using, which has the same effect here. The seal of ownership. Now you think of in the first century, as I had a little image here, that wax seal on a letter. Right. It's been sealed and kept. What is that in the Christian's life? It's the Holy Spirit. Is our seal. It's keeping us. And another analogy, which is the same, the same message, is they deposit. Now the idea is when you go to, for example, in the 21st century. When you go to purchase a home, you can put down as little as, as one cent on a house as a deposit and sign the paper. And no one can buy the house from you if you put money down. And I think it's a penny. I think it's... Wow. I think it's... Once you sign the paper and you put money down, the contract is in motion now. You could back out of it or something could happen. But nobody can come in and buy that house if you put money down and sign the papers. The Holy Spirit residing in our hearts as believers is proof positive... God has sealed us and put a deposit within us to ensure us to get home. Now, you you can, as a Christian, can never go to hell. Right. Because if you go to hell, God has cast himself in there with the Holy Spirit along in you. Right. So don't think that God can somehow, if he does, he's a liar. He breaks the contract with you. He says, I know that I put my deposit down on you, but I'm going to take it back. Right. And for you, the, the miracle it took to save you, is incomprehensible. Yes. But the miracle it would take to get you into hell is also equally incomprehensible. <laughs> right. right? Because for God to unforgive your sins, he'd have to break a promise, right. he'd have to be a liar, and have to pull the Holy Spirit out of you all at the same time. Yeah. Nullify the work of Christ. Absolutely right. Yeah. He'd have to somehow take the suffering of Christ that was for you and then put that upon you. There's there's no way a man who is truly saved and has the Holy Spirit can be unsaved, exactly. unsealed, unguaranteed. Right. So Paul's saying here, and I'm using the same analogy because it means the same sort of thing. Look, we didn't get back to Corinth like we wanted to. We're sorry about that. You know, it didn't happen. But the Holy Spirit never lies. And even though I couldn't return, um, proof that, uh, that Christ is going to return is the Holy Spirit residing in you. Now we're going to move on to the restoration of a church member. Mm. So last week we saw the thunder and the you know heard the boom and the thunder and all that sort of thing. <laughs> we saw the the punishment. Paul last time I said this. Paul gave the knife last time, and now he brings out the salve. Right. Sad. He's cut, and now he's going to heal. Right. The cut's important, and the healing is important. Very good. Both are necessary. Had to cut out that sin right. from the church. The man sleeping with his, with his stepmother had to cut out the sin of how they abuse the Lord's Supper. Right. Cut out the sin of the idolatry in the church and the false philosophy. Had to cut that stuff out, which is very painful. Mm. And now he's come back, and to help the healing process mm. provides a salve. Amen. Cameron? 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 10. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grief me as he has grieved all of you to some extent not to put it too severely now n notice how the sin of the one man in the church the man sleeping with his mother stepmother we think impacted all the church he gr caused grief to them all mm -hmm. so he says he has not so much grieved me as grieved all of you to some extent everybody's affected by the sin in the right. church definitely the punishment inflicted on him by the major is, su is sufficient majority <laughs> majority is sufficient now instead, you ought to forgive me and comfort him, 
so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Now, if you recall from last week, let me ask this question. How did the majority of the church members at Corinth inflict punishment on this man? Turned him over to Satan. Right. Kicked him out. <laughs> they didn't take him and stone him or right. beat him and tie him to a tree and whip him. But you're right, which is far worse. They just excommunicate this yeah, guy, kick him out of the church. Turn him back to the world. Just let him... If the man is saved, this is going to you know, be hard for him. Yeah. And that is so hard to do in this day and age because, mm. and I've seen it so many times, uh, someone is caught up in sin in the church and you, you pull them aside and you say, you know, you, you need to watch that, and you confess of that, repent of that. What do they do? They go to the next church down the road. Well, yeah, they get mad. The next church says, well, come on in. Okay. We accept all kinds of people and backgrounds <laughs> and everything. They have not repented of that sin. They just moved it down the road, haven't they? Right. And because there's a church literally on every street corner, or practically on every street corner, right. and denominations galore, people have the freedom to just kind of do consumerism in the church. Right. I'm going to shop around and find one that offers this or offers that. And, yeah, I'm going to find a church that's not so judgmental right. about the sin of adultery. I'm just going to go somewhere else and, and worship. One that accepts me for me. In Corinth, it wasn't like that. You had one church. There was a church in the house of, of Priscilla and Aquila. And once you joined up with that church, and the whole community knew it, if you were Jewish, the synagogue expelled you. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're a Greek pagan, they ostracized you from their herd. You literally on an island by yourself, pun intended, <laughs> right? And by, you're out by yourself, uh, away from everyone. And they did this, this guy. And then verse 8, I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Right. He's, su he's suffered enough. Paul says, now love the man. You've done, he's done enough. You yeah. all yes. voted him out. And now that's good news. Out. That's good news for us when we sin, that we repent and seek the forgiveness of the Lord. We can be forgiven and restored. Amen. I think when a church votes a man out and he repents, they ought to vote him back in. Amen. Amen. Another reason I wrote you, I, I wrote, to, oh, wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Very good. Now, Paul doesn't stand as their priest forgiving their sins for them. <laughs> but when somebody wrongs you, you ought to forgive them. And I think what Paul is saying here is he's reconciled the anger and the hate that he had toward this guy in his heart. He's already been forgiven of that. That's been resolved. And he's just saying now, bury the hatchet. Right. You can't get past this sin the man has done unless you he's he's repented, it's been established, you stop the sin, and you all have to forgive him and bring him back in. It's important to do that. Should the church practice discipline? Should they? Yes. Yes, I say yes. And well, you shouldn't do that. This is the 21st century. Yeah. It, it, as a pastor, Jerry, if you practice church discipline, we're going to go down the road to the next Baptist church. And we can't afford to lose anybody. Yeah. Well, these days, um, again, you've got to be you've got to be biblically minded in this and see. Well, number one, the person that has sinned has sinned against God. He needs to repent. He needs to get this worked out with God. He's hurt people by his sin. Mm -hmm. He's tarnished the name of Christ in the church. He's hurt the church. And so if the church is to be a healthy church, there has to be church discipline. Otherwise, sin like leaven will just raise the whole lump and uh, impact and infect the entire church and tarnish the gospel, witness or testimony of the church. And it's painful. It's and nobody painful. wants to do it. No, I, I, would, I would dread practicing church discipline on a brother or sister in Christ. Yeah, it's... People don't like confrontation. I mean, yeah. what kind of weirdo likes confrontation in this kind of people you're supposed to, love, supposed to love and care about? But it's necessary, and it has to be done for all the reasons you just mentioned. Now, if this individual did not repent when asked or called upon to repent, then you have to take those steps to excommunicate the person from the church. But if you can go to somebody in church, and you know, like you said earlier, and say, you know, you, you, you've sinned and you need to repent of this thing, and, and they do and you pray with them, then, then it's all right, I think. I think that's the biblical pattern. Amen. But if they don't repent, and you take some people with you, and they still don't repent, then you've got to vote them out and turn them over to Satan so they can learn their lesson 
and repent. And we get that in the Gospel of Matthew. Christ tells us to do that in his letter. Uh, he said, not in his letter, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says that as a template for how we should handle conflict in the assembly right. of believers. Right. Now this is this kicking somebody out of the church is a last resort. Right. You go to that man first to, to restore him, and then if that's if he doesn't, right, right, then this is the very last thing you would do. Right. Mm. Here's the next one. Law equals death mm -hmm. and spirit equals life. Second Corinthians three, seven through eleven. Now if, now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone. Now, what did God give people in the Old Testament that was engraved on stone? Ministry? Well, what did he give them that was engraved on stone tablets and that was carried down from Sinai? What did God give the people of Israel? Uh, letter, ministry? <laughs> or, okay. Bible? Uh, the Ten Commandments on those two tablets by Moses. Right, that, that's that's what oh. God had carved on the two tablets, right. engraved in letters on stone, was the right. Ten Commandments. Yeah. Now that ministry, and that's it's weird calling that thing a ministry, right? That function, that service of God, brought death. Yes. The Ten Commandments, it, well, it's God's it's moral code for man. It is necessary. It leads you not to life, right? Because we're not keepers of the Ten Commandments. We strive to do that, but we can't keep them, right? All it does is reveal how sinful we are. As Paul says in Galatians, it's a tutor to drive us to Christ. It, what, the law, what the law effectively does, the law was to show us how sinful we are. Right. The law brings us death. It doesn't, it doesn't bring us life because we can't, we can't abide by that system. To, nobody ever could right. to bring life. Right. The law shows us we're lawbreakers. That's its purpose, to drive us to Christ. Amen. Who kept the law for us. Your mom got it right. She said Ten Commandments. That's right. Yeah. So the law, and that's Charles and Heston there. What a great... Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> that's okay. Well, you just weren't tuned, tuned in there to that. Let's continue on here. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in the letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitionary, though it was, will not be the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Hmm. Now pause and just kind of make sense of what Paul said here. If you recall the Old Testament story when Moses was on the mountain with God for all those all those days getting the Ten Commandments, uh, he spent so much time with God that his skin actually glowed, and it caused troubles because when because now it wasn't Moses' glory; it was God's glory, right. like, like a sunburn. Right. It was a glorious Shekinah sunburn, burn, right? Okay. That okay. Moses radiated. He glowed at night. He because he's in the presence of God for so long, his skin glowed. And it scared the people so much, they had to cover over his, make a, a, a mask for his face to hide it because it scared them. Now, some people, I don't believe this to be true, but some people say that Moses, they made the mask for Moses not to hide him from scaring people, but that the glory was fading and he wanted people to think he still had the glory. Now, I don't mm -hmm. think that's Moses. But I think it was so terrifying that the mask, the, the, the mm -hmm. sack was put on his face to keep people from just being terrified. What would you make a guy walking in the room who's glowing, right? Right. <laughs> Like those angels from uh, Twilight, right? That sparkle, right? But <laughs> yeah. uh, he glowed. He's even more than that. But Paul says, if the process that gave us the law came with the glory of God, how much more will the ministry of the Holy Spirit that comes to us even bring more glory? Right. If the ministry that brought con condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Very good. So the, the, the law brings death. The Spirit brings righteousness, right? Are we doing the hand thing? <laughs> and if, if if the first glory that came with the law was it was a death bringing glory, right? How much glorious is the Holy Spirit who comes and brings us righteousness? Right. For what was glory has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitionary came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? <laughs> Glory, glory, glory. We see that glory. one, don't we? <laughs> glory, 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 glory. We have two glories. The glory of the Old Covenant, which which radiated from Moses' face, was a type of glory. It was a secondary glory. It was a sunburn kind of a glory. An S-O-N burn, a sunburn glory. Mm -hmm. As he spent time in the presence of the Son, who gave him the law. That was glory. But it pales in comparison to the glory which God gives an example of this is the, the transfiguration story. Mm -hmm. Moses and Elijah in the presence of Jesus on the mountain and the disciples, Peter, James, and John, are looking from a, little, from a distance. 
and the glory that comes from Christ, from inside of Christ, his own glory, didn't reflect glory, he radiates glory, is so bright it overshadows the, the glory Moses and Elijah would have so had from being in heaven. <laughs> the glory that they had as saints is reflective glory, not radiating glory. It's like the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. The sun radiates light and energy, and the moon only reflects it. Exactly. Moses' glory walking off that mountain was radiant, uh, reflective glory, shining the, the glory that he got from being the presence of God. But the glory which we have from the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and from Christ, the God, the Holy Spirit in our hearts, is, is, the, is the real deal. Right. It will overshadow the transient, temporary, transitory glory Transitory glory. That's waiting for a song. If you guys are watching this, uh, the transitory glory, right? Uh, that Moses said, we want a greater glory. So, question six. What has the most glory? The old covenant written on stone tablets or the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. Amen. God himself has more glory than two tablets of stone, which contain, which are very important. Yeah. Are they still around today? They've been lost to time. Oh. Second Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds are made dual, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not only been removed, because only in Christ it is taken away. I'm going to go back to the previous slide there. It said... Um, Referring to that Old Testament story, Moses is veiling his face. You can read the story if you want to back in the, the Pentateuch, right? The first five books of the Bible. Um, the glory that Moses had was fading because it wasn't his glory. It was like, you know, we get a sunburn and it hurts, right. and it, it's, it, but it passes away in time. Right. That's temporary. But the people of Israel, their minds were made dull. The people of Paul's day, the Jews of Paul's day, the synagogue literally down the street in Ephesus where he's writing this letter, their minds are made dull for this very day because that veil remains when the old covenant's read. And meaning that when they hear the law being read, their hearts are so veiled, they can't see the law for what it truly is. It has not been removed because only in Christ is that law taken away. Their minds are made dull, their sin still remains, the veil is over their heart, because they don't know Christ as Savior. When they hear the law, they don't hear Christ. Right. They hear all bad news and not good news. You see, the law is bad news for the believer. Yes. The law only shows you're a law breaker, doesn't it? Right. And Christ is the law keeper. The good news for us, and, and good preaching is not, is not uh, good advice. Right. Try harder, do better, keep the law. Good preaching is you haven't kept the law no matter how hard you try. Number what good you do. The good news is Christ has kept the law for you. Right. Right. We'll see in a little bit down here. Imputed righteousness. Amen. So only in Christ is it taken away. We'll continue on here. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Now notice that the Jews of the first century were blinded. This veil covered their hearts. They were unable to see the truth of the gospel from the Old Testament. Right. And this is true today for those of the Jewish faith who don't see Christ in the Old Testament. They have been veiled to this day. Hmm. Maybe into the Gentiles. Fullness of the Gentiles is complete, as Paul says. Yeah. Who knows? But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Once you see Christ in the Bible, you can't not see Christ in the Bible. Right. I see it in every page of the Amen. Old Testament. I see it between the lines. <laughs> I see the allegorized type and shadow of the life of Jonah, the life of David. I see it uh, in, all, in all pages. Of the, in fact, uh, you can look for it in the Song of Solomon. It's probably stuck in there too, believe it or not. It's in every part of the Old Testament. Song of Solomon. Right? But you have to be a Christian to see it. Right. There's a sense in which you have to have the key to the code to crack the code. Right. And I, think, that. and I think is when you see it, when you see Christ, you don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. But inevitably, there's going to be somebody that will want you to go back. And I think the Judaizers that, that uh, Paul had to confront were saying you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. You mm -hmm. have to keep the law in order to be saved. But once you, once you see Christ, you don't want to go back to the Old Covenant because the Old Covenant has given way to the New Covenant. Yeah, that's right. No benefit. 
I think once you see Christ, you can't unsee it. I mean, you know those, those books, Where's Waldo books? Yeah, yeah. I found a Where's Spock book. Got it for Christmas. A Where's Spock book. <laughs> and it's just like a Where's Waldo book. You look at these pages here, and uh, you'll see somewhere in the book, you'll see Spock. And once you see it, it's hard to not... To, it's hard not to see it when you look at it again. I never could find him on that page. Uh, he's in the, <laughs> the... The only example I'll pull up that it's harder to find. He's, he's, I think his head's sticking... There he is. His head's sticking oh, in the oh, oh. His head's sticking. Yeah. If you go to every page, and you've seen it before... I think he's over here flying around here somewhere in his ship. Once you see it, or where, where's Waldo? You can't unsee it. And once you see Christ in the Old Covenant, you can't... Your veil's been lifted. Now right. you know it's in there. You're looking right. for it. Amen. And we all, who with unveiled faces can contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. How is the veil lifted when it comes to entering the presence of God under the new covenant? How, Jared, can you take that on there? How, how, does the veil, how does God lift the veil when you become a right. Christian? The, the word I think I would use would be regeneration. Being born again, born from above, uh, being being granted that new life in Christ. Uh, you know, I, I I went along in church uh, as a kid, and I remember sitting and thinking about what I would play when I got home on Sunday morning. I had dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs. I think about how I'm going to do that or soldiers. Made you a kid. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm going to have a battle and stuff. And how the preacher was just went on and on and on. It was the most boring day of the week. And all of a sudden, one Sunday, everything he said, I heard. Mm -hmm. you know, I realized I was sinful, and I realized that Christ could save me. Something happened that took the veil off of me so that I could see my sin and Christ who could save me. And uh, it's so it's, clear. Yeah, Holy it is, Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the, uh, the one who takes that veil from us. Mm -hmm. But you have to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. The gospel has to be preached. You won't get the gospel in a church that doesn't preach law and gospel. Right. You won't get the gospel in, the, in a church that preaches self-esteem right. or, you know, uh, materialistic, uh, what would you say, uh, uh, gospel, prosperity gospel. You won't get it in a church that doesn't preach the gospel. Right. We need to be told the truth that we are sinful, that we're lawbreakers, and that Christ kept the law for us and died to save us. We'll continue on here. Proper perspective. Second Corinthians four sixteen through eighteen. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away; yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Our bodies are wasting away, mm. right? Every day you get a little older. You haven't experienced the wasting away part yeah. yet, but when you're a little bit older, you, and I'm not even old, and we're not really old compared to a lot of people, but when people get to be a, really, really old, right? I won't put a number to that, <laughs> but you, you, you get the real sense that your body is wasting away. But Paul says that's to be expected, right? But we are renewing every day. We're becoming like new every day because... Where Christ, we're growing the inside. What we can't see, the eternal part of us, the eternal, what waits for us in glory, uh, is eternal. Hmm. Well, what keeps Christians from being overly concerned with all the cares of the world? Hmm. I, I'm just so upset about coronavirus. I'm just so upset about the politics and who's president, who's senator. Whenever you die, you're going to heaven and none of this matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it won't matter to us once we're dead to some way, degree anyway. Yeah, all the troubles end then if you're saved. But there's an eternal perspective that we often lose sight of because we get so caught up in the forest, we can't see the trees, right? Right, right. Oh, man, I can't see the whole landscape because I'm so focused on what's right in front of me. Right. So we need to kind of get more of an eternal perspective at times. When you get upset, say, look, am I really, is, should this really bother me this much? And Right. Well, you hear all the time, Christians should be the most happiest people in the world. Mm. Christians should always smile. And part of that statement, I get where it's coming from, but there's a lot that can afflict us and make us sad. But... We're, I think what that person is saying is that there's something that we have that that transcends the pain and suffering of this world, mm -hmm. and that we need to think about that. We need to have hope. Yep. What is this hope? Christians should have hope, whereas the world is hopeless. We have hope. And don't don't fake it. Don't pretend you have hope. Right. Have hope. Think. Right. Realize you have hope. And yeah, you can be you can be brokenhearted and still have hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a person's 
spiritual maturity can be determined by how quickly they lose their joy. Right. Right. So if you're like bopping down the road, singing Christian songs and, and, yeah. and cloud nine, and then somebody cuts you off in traffic and you all automatically give them a one fingered salute right. or say yeah. a curse word, your joy being taken away so quickly reveals how immature you were as a believer. Right. right. A sin bearer. Sin bearer. You were a ring bearer so thinking, not long yeah. ago. Yeah. What did a ring bearer do? What's a ring bearer? Did you growl when you walked down the aisle? <laughs> no. You missed, it, missed a good chance to be the good ring bearer. But... Oh, but I did say something interesting. Oh. Well, you were a ring bearer. It means you carried the ring in the wedding recently. Now, Christ is the sin bearer. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become righteousness of God. Very good. The clearest example of double imputation in the scriptures. Now, double imputation means imputation means putting something on someone. Yeah. Not amputation, not double amputation. <laughs> oh man, right. <laughs> this is imputation. Double imputation. It's giving somebody, not removing or amputation means removing a limb. Right. Imputation is putting something on. The first Imputation here is putting on Christ's sin, making him sin, who never had sin. And the second imputation is on us, giving us righteousness, right? We become righteousness right. of God by, by effect what Christ has done for those who come to him in right. faith. Double imputation, putting sin on Christ and by effect making us not guilty, putting righteousness upon us. Right. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I'm going to skip the Benson commentary and just go right here. Let's go to Yoked Folks. How about that? Yoked Folks. You like these titles? Don't you? Uh, yeah, these are nice. <laughs> Yoked Folks. 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 15. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Mm. Now, of course, we use this specifically when it comes to marriage. Don't marry an unbeliever. Right. right? Because people think, well, I've heard people, women say, women and men, oftentimes ladies say, I know he's not a church girl. I know he's not born again, but I'll change that. I, I'll get him saved. I'll get him in church. But you know, that hardly ever happens. Right. Uh, pastor of church for years, a lady had the delusion that her husband would come to Christ just because she was a Christian. Now, it's good that, good that you love your spouse. And if you are married, Paul would say, don't divorce your unbelieving spouse. Stick with them. Uh, but he gives the advice, give the warning. Don't, don't marry an unbeliever. Right. You have no guarantee that by your presence, you're going to save that person. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is you end up compromising yourself. Yep. That person will draw you out of church, will draw you out of fellowship. He'll, right. He or she will... Wound your spirit. I mean, wound you emotionally. Right. Draw you out of church, and it'll be more harmful for you. Now, you don't have um, ought to have unbelieving friends for sure. And we'll look at this in a moment here. He's not saying never have contacts with unbelievers. Right. Don't join a monastery and, and, and a cluster of people and stay away from ever. But you need to not yoke up with them. Right. And it's not just in marriage. That's one aspect of it. It's also in uh, in areas of influence of your life. So what's the consequence of fellowshipping with unbelievers? Yeah. You might become one yourself, an unbeliever. Oh yeah, you could be drunk very much. Well, you might not become a not. You might not be unsaved, but you can be yeah. an unbeliever. Yeah. Yeah. You can fall away from the faith. Yeah, you can shipwreck your faith. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. He could draw you. He or she draw from the paths of immorality. Um, all kinds of stuff can come, can come of that. Yeah. Let's move on to the next one. Super Apostle. Hmm. Excited about this one, aren't you, Cameron? I don't, I'm not a Super Apostle. Oh. And you'll see why. Superman. <laughs> so we have a little Super Apostles cartoon. It's not, what, it's, not quite, it's not quite what I had in mind when I appointed you, my apostles, and asked you to go out and save lives. <laughs> These guys became Super Apostles, didn't they? Like their emblems are all some form of a cross there. <laughs> right. <laughs> very, very perceptive there. Very. Super Apostles. Good thing or bad thing? You think? Oh, uh, uh, you got him on the fence. Yeah, Move yeah. up and read the text here. All right. Second Corinthians 11, 21 through 29. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Jealousy. 
God is a jealous God. Mm-hmm. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the ser- ser- serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jews we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put it up with it easily enough. Amen. Mm-hmm. Paul wants you to know, wants the readers at Corinth to know, and us to know too, they came with a different Jesus, they had a different spirit, and made a different gospel. Mm. Right? Which offers a different kind of heaven, which is not mm-hmm. heaven at all. Oh, but Paul is upset because he so easily abandoned the gospel message he had delivered right. and so quickly picked up this new philosophy, right? This right. this other cult came into the church and right. so quickly turned away from the truth to something that was yeah. false. And I like how Paul at the beginning said, you know, I'm the fool here. And right. I'm the one that's foolish. Right. And in fact, you're the ones that have wandered away so quickly from the truth. Who's the fool? Yeah. He even says, permit, permit my foolishness here. Let me in, indulge for a second. <laughs> Uh, so the Corinthians had just left the gospel, and he's, that's what this is about here. I do not think I am the least inferior to those super apostles. <laughs> I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Now the super apostles may not be, were not bitten by a radioactive spider, <laughs> but they were deceived by poisonous snakes. <laughs> <snow. laughs> Very good. <laughs> but, <laughs> so these soup, these people who call themselves super apostles were like. Like Apollos, he, though he did repent and come around and got yeah. his theology straight, they were articulate, they were good public speakers, they were very persuasive, they were very articulate, they were everything they wanted to hear. Yeah. And Paul says, look, I was an untrained speaker, and I have knowledge, and I gave you the gospel, um, but these people came in and deceived you. Yeah, they, they impressed them to death, didn't they? <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> yeah, t- yeah, that's right. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to f- you free of charge? Now, Paul didn't, didn't he p- took up a love offering with the church at Jerusalem a couple of times, but he did not charge anybody for the gospel message. He didn't make it mandatory. He put a cup out and said, okay, now I'm going to preach as soon as the cup gets full. <laughs> right. none, none of that sort of thing. I, I'll call our minds back to Acts 18, verses 1 and 3. Can you pick that up for me? Yeah. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Now, we know that when Paul goes to Athens, excuse me, he leaves Athens and goes to Corinth, the first couple that he sees is Priscilla and Aquila, right. Jews who were expelled from Rome. And because they have a common vocation, and they're both Jews, right? And genetically, ethnically, religiously, they hook up. He leads them to Christ, starts a church in their house, he lives with them, and, and he pulls his own weight, doesn't he? Yeah. He doesn't live off of tithes and offerings. He literally, yeah, he's a tent maker by trade, so he just makes tents. He does his vocation there. He says to the church of Corinth, Did I charge you for the gospel? Nope. Gave it to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, was I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I've kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. Very good. He did take love offerings, right? He's not saying that ministers should never take a pay because he, here in this very text, meant, says that he robbed other churches. What he meant was he took money from them as they supported him so he wouldn't have to take money from the church of Corinth because they accused him, oh, he's just in it for your money. Right. He always gets an offering wherever he goes. He's trying to say, look, I didn't even take an offering from you guys because that bothered you so much. I let the church in Macedonia provide my needs, and I was a tent maker in the house of Priscilla and Aquila. I, f- I paid my own way and had some other support. I didn't burden it because I want to give you ammunition for saying I was just a money-grubbing right. televangelist right. You know, before there was even a tele. Right. <laughs> so, again, that's where Paul tries to not be offensive to his weaker brothers. Right. Good. Let's move on. A reason to boast is a participation trophy. Second Corinthians 11, uh, 21 through 29. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. Oh, that we were too weak for that. Whatever, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking about as a fool. I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. 
Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been imprisoned more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the, in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled, <laughs> and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Very good. Thank you. Danger at sea, danger at home, <laughs> danger, danger, here danger. danger, there danger, everywhere danger, danger. Uh, so he he suffered physically. He, I bear the marks of suffering on my body you know, for Christ. He literally had suffered real abuse yeah. because of the gospel's sake. And it didn't all come from outside the church. Right. He even mentions inside the church, and inside those who, who should have cared about him most. Right. Uh, but he did, of course, get all kinds of Gentiles, Jews. They all sort of made Paul the punching bag. Uh, he, he pushes on. Cameron, what did you learn about Paul from this? He pushes on, and no matter what he goes through, he's determined to spread the word about Christ. Live as Christ, dies gain, right? Mm -hmm. If Christ took him home, he was more than happy with that. Right. But if he was permitted to stay, he would put up with that for a bit for someone else's good, right? Right. And thanks for reading that. You would put the good emphasis mm -hmm. on the right uh, uh, persecution of Paul's letter there. A real pain in the neck or a thorn in the side. Uh -huh. <laughs> Second Corinthians 12, 6 through 10. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so, but I refrain, <coughs> so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that in Christ's power may so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight I delight in weaknesses, and in insults, and in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, that was Paul's thorn, and Paul doesn't tell us what it was. We can speculate, and and I think that. The consent with the majority of it's not a consensus, but the majority of scholars seem to think it had something to do with his eyesight, right? And I believe that too. I, I, I that makes the most sense to me. We know we know that he was blinded in the Maus on the Maus road, and we know that like scales fell from his eyes and you know that sort of thing. And we got to think that could have caused some long term damage. And I think he may have been stoned at one point and was maybe hit in the eye with the stone. I forgot right. the details of that specifically. And we know for a fact that he had a scribe. He mentions his scribes by name at the end of his letters. Mm -hmm. And at one point in Galatians, he says, see what large letters I write? Right. It seems to indicate he took the pen out of the scribe's hand to write the last few words of Galatians. Paul suffered, and even if he didn't, even if he didn't have astigmatism or eye damage or cataracts, even if he didn't have those things, he was a man who was well into his 60s in the first century without prescriptive lenses, <laughs> without cataract surgery without the, the the things we take for granted just having glasses and i I'm, you know my prescription my glasses is pretty strong and cameras is too and if we lived a thousand years ago there's many jobs that we couldn't do just with bad eyesight you couldn't be a lookout on a ship you'd miss the whole land right it's blind to slam land i have to hit the land oh i think i see the land now the boat is the front of the boats hit the land you know what i mean we've run aground i think i see the land now captain <laughs> get off their crow's nest jared you're a horrible lookout uh, but you know so there's a lot of jobs a lot of things you couldn't do in the first century or you know, anywhere in time just until they invented glasses Okay, so I'm establishing the fact that even if Paul didn't have a physical injury, which we, we know he had, 
just his age alone lets us know he probably had degenerative issues with his eyes. Just right. roll, roll the dice. That's the odds. I think that's his thorn. And God doesn't take that away from him. Not that it wouldn't help Paul's ministry. It certainly would have. If Paul could write his own letters, how much more efficient would you be probably writing your own thoughts as opposed to waiting for a scribe to come in and right. get his equipment up? You could do it so much more efficiently. And it could have been something else. But whatever that thorn was, God didn't take it away. And here's the question. Why was Paul given the thorn? Mm -hmm. He tells us that. Uh, because I think it's a good representative that God will throw things at us that might not be good to test us. Like, mm -hmm. for example, if he puts a thorn in his life, that's testing him. And when we read that God tested him, we can know that if God th throws something bad in our life, it was, pro it was probably a test. Very good. You know, God allowed those Roman soldiers to give his son a thorn, mm -hmm. a crown of thorns, and did not remove that from him. Mm -hmm. Why would we be any different? You know, why would Paul expect to have less, less thorns in his side than Christ had in his brow? Right. What was the thorn? I said it maybe as an eyesight. Mm -hmm. People have speculated, what do they say? Sexual sins, uh, pride, anger, yeah. poor anger control. I've heard all kinds of stuff. And I think what people often do is they just, they project on their right. call their own issues. Right. So when I say a bad eyesight, I'm projecting a little bit too. <laughs> Though dimly projecting with my eyesight. Uh. <laughs> you got it? I don't know. What happens to the thorn? Well, it leaves Paul's life with the moment that he dies. Right. Which is the, the best that we have, right? You'd rather live this life a quadriplegic as a Christian and die and enter heaven and experience resurrection and glorified body at some point than to leave this life an Olympic athlete and step into the life without Christ, the next life without Christ in the hell. Right. Whatever that thorn was, it only lasted as long as Paul Paul's flesh lasted. A light momentary state. affliction. Mm -hmm. And we're almost finished, guys. Appreciate you guys sticking this out. 2 Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. And we know that Paul sent the first letter by way of Timothy. Mm -hmm. And the second letter is sent by way of Titus. And it's, his, what he's saying is we confirm by two or three witnesses. He becomes a, the, really the third witness, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. It's a reference to Deuteronomy 19, 15, if I pick that up. A single witness shall not suffice against a person. For any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Amen. Now, didn't Paul bring a charge against this, this church? Mm -hmm. A lot of criminal charges. Old Testament law-breaking charges, criminal. And he sent two, three witnesses with letters from him. Right. Um, and you know what? So he established that. Now, I think this, this template of the two witnesses we see in when Christ sends out the 70 in the New Testament mm. by two witnesses. Now, some religious cults use that today to send their witnesses out by yes, two. Uh, witnesses out by two. Right. Witnesses. Witnesses. So I don't want to say, say witnesses. I, didn't, I don't want to say who they are. But God's I, witnesses, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and I won't say which denomination it is, but I, I'll say this. I think that's the template for it. Now, when Christ speaks... He doesn't need the other. He doesn't need another person to speak with him because he speaks only the Father gives him, and that's the second witness, mm -hmm. right? So he's John, Gospel of John. Christ only speaks with the Father. It has him to speak, and that's the second witness to establish what he says, right. which is kind of neat. That's why Christ doesn't need somebody else to go with him. In the Book of Acts, Peter goes out. John's right beside him in his heels. Right. When you see Paul, he's got Silas. He's got Silas until he has Luke, right? Mm -hmm. He's got he's got Silas and he has Barnabas, right? So we see the New Testament template, even though these these missionaries go out, they're often going two by two, establishing the charge, you've sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the good news but Christ can redeem. That's mm. pretty cool. Amen. Now, the, do, does a preaching have to come with two people? That doesn't have to come with two people. Under the Old Covenant, that was the template to show that you need these two witnesses to make sure that the claim was valid. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. Mm -hmm. 
wraps it up pretty pretty harshly. What what text what verse was that? Second Corinthians 13, 1 and 2. Oh, did I leave that from last week? I made the last week. Let's see my to me I'm thinking that there's uh the very last question, last verse last week. Sacrifice to idols. Last question last week down there in the December. Where did I find that? Because I apologize. I, to me, I'm thinking this verse was from the first Corinthians letter we had from last year. If you guys looking at this at home, uh, it's it's going to be a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> I will now repeat. Mm, doesn't show it there, does it? No. How about an end of this book? Yeah. Why do Paul take church so seriously? Okay, I guess it was in Corinthians 13. I just didn't put it I in. I now repeat so. it. <laughs> That's it. Okay, my bad. So, see, my mind was glitching. Like, he, he comes back to church as a woman. So, we read that verse. I would not spare those who sinned earlier. Or any of the others. Why did Paul, we close this out tonight. Why did Paul take church discipline so seriously? Why so serious? <laughs> It was necessary. I mean, it was so necessary for the res restoration of the one who sinned and also the recovery of those whom he sinned against, the damage that it caused. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, it, it, it's against Christ and robs God of his glory and tarnishes the testimony of the church. Sin is never good, and until it's dealt with, uh, it'll continue to drastically impact everybody. So you got to take, if you take Sanctification seriously, you take church discipline seriously. You take holiness seriously, you take church discipline seriously. That's right. Anything to add to that, Kimber? Well, I think when raising a child, you have to give them discipline. It's good to give them discipline. And so he's like raising this church. And yeah. in, in order for the church to go strong, he needs to give them discipline. That's right. And that's your yeah. favorite part of being a child, isn't the discipline that you experience? Oh, I, I loved it. Growing up. That's yeah. great. Is it time more. to be disciplined? <laughs> well, Father, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Earthly parents are inconsistent in their discipline, and they aren't perfect. Right. But God is perfect. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, earthly parents only discipline or correct when it's necessary. And just like Paul, would Paul have to write this letter if there was not dysfunction in the church? No. Right. In fact, the only reason Paul wrote any letter that he had ever written, he's called an occasional or task theologian, is because there was a problem in the church. A lot of times it was a moral problem. Galatians, it was a Judaizer heresy, right? But in this church, it was a moral problem that he writes the letters right. to him. So if there was no problems in the church, we'd have nothing from Paul except Romans. <laughs> right. So I'm glad that there was problems in these churches. At least right. I get the benefit from reading more of Paul. Right. And to realize that there will be problems in the churches. Real Christians have real problems. Real, genuine, saved people can sin greatly. And they need to be repentant and restored. Let's close out in prayer. Any pressing prayer concerns tonight? Uh, Dylan and his half-brother. Yeah, we'll keep praying for my nephew Dylan and his half-brother. Uh, that family, he, his half-brother died. Mm. Uh, eight, 19 years old, young man. Mm. Uh, also pray for... Uh, Jerry spoke to him I think yesterday. He says Jerry Corbin has uh, he's on the night. It does vertigo. Oh gosh, that's not fun. We have a couple of weeks now. Um, pray for those folks getting the vaccine. Some folks in the church have started getting their shots and pray that it goes well. There's no side effects and pray that it does keep them from getting COVID. You know, God who who allows COVID to run or the free also allows men to create the vaccine. That's right. So right. grace can come even in this. Right. Amen. Anything else we close out tonight, guys? Any pressing prayer concerns? The Feudus, anything? <laughs> if there's not, we'll close out in prayer. Jerry, close yeah. us out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight, Lord. And as always, we're thankful to spend time in your word, learning more about you and our Savior and the truth. Help us, Lord, to hear and to understand and apply what we've learned tonight. Father, thank you for the grace you give us to live in a world that has fallen. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of the gospel. Help us to be faithful in our witness and lifestyle for Christ, that others may see Christ in us. Draw them to you, Father, and redeem them. Father, we pray for the many needs that are present uh, in this whole world. Uh, the ones we know about, Lord, we bring to you concern from a heart filled with love and, and worry at times for these folks. We just pray that you'd be with them all and give, Lord, uh, what is needed according to your will. Forgive us for our many sins in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, we're next. We're going to be next week, and uh, what's the next letter coming up? Ephesians. I forgot. Uh,
what's next on the list here? Uh, Galatians. 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 Tune in next week for Galatians. See you guys Sunday morning. Worship service. Uh, Salem Baptist Church broadcast. Great study on demonology. I've caught all four of them. They get better every week. Maybe oh, so. they get longer too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, if you guys have been watching a study on demons, I'd encourage you to tune in. That they're good stuff. They popped in my recommended. <laughs> you need to watch his studies sometime. Um, see you guys Sunday. Tune in 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock worship service. One more thing. At noon, we'll broadcast Lord's Supper live. And if you'd like to get those elements, we'll get those delivered to you by Sunday so you can take them with us awesome. remotely. Awesome. God bless. Take care.